All right, this particular shelf is going to be a little bit different pertaining to my recording because usually I record either on political affairs or spiritual affairs or government, worldly affairs or whatever. This is going to be about the animal kingdom and um, I find it to be fascinating that people to this day still don't understand the concept of the ecosystem that flows within our oceans and our seas that has been in place now for millions of years and it just so happens the subject matter that we're fixing to talk about right now is is basically uh, the, the lower the food chain regarding being uh, scavengers kind of like a catfish it wants to you know stay on the bottom and, and collect whatever remains well that's that's how I foresee the subject matter that they're fixing to talk about as far as being a scavenger that really never has um, never has evolved to the point of becoming mature enough to uh, to be like the rest of the sea animals please listen and then after we get through with this, we're going to go back, back even further into another subject matter that I think my viewers will enjoy. Please listen. We go beyond the forecast to give you the how and why on all the cool and interesting things that you've wanted, uh, wondered about and wanted to ask in weather, space, and science. Today's show is about an animal that many people are frequently fascinated by, and we're talking about sharks. We're going to look at everything from what triggers a shark attack to how climate trends can impact their migration. So joining us as today's expert is Gavin Naylor, and he's the director of the Florida Program for Shark Research at the Florida Museum of Natural History. So Gavin, thank you so much for making time for us here today. It's a pleasure to be on the show. Well, we're glad to speak with you. And Gavin, the big picture, what about sharks draws us in? Why are so many people interested in sharks more so than maybe dolphins or porpoises or something like that? That's an interesting question. I, uh, I don't know, but I think it's because we have a deep-seated need to be terrified by mysterious uh, monsters, and it's like the you know the, the monsters under the bed when you're a little child. The ocean is beautiful and calm and glassy, but right underneath that still surface are large animals, some of which can occasionally bite you. And I think that sort of titillates people, and I think almost think people sort of want to be terrified. I think there's a human need. To, to have that sort of adrenaline rush. Yeah. I can That's the only thing I can come up with because it makes no rational sense. The number of people bitten by sharks is minuscule. So why we seem to enjoy talking about it and thinking about it is, uh, is a little bit peculiar. To me, it's not peculiar. To me, it's been embedded into our DNA regarding fear factors, the same as we now fear um, poison spiders, we fear uh, serpents, uh, we fear um, other creatures, lions, tigers, whatever, because we know that they can do deadly damage to us, and it ain't so much that we're fascinated by them in, in wanting to be intrigued, but we're fascinated by them towards wanting to get away from them, that way we give them their distance. In other words, we respect them. That's in most cases. Some illogical people that don't think the way other people think um, are fascinated by them because they're attracted to them for some reason. Don't ask me why. I think it's got something to do with the genetics. But ordinarily, we are frightened to death of the boogeyman. Oh, that's what we've been taught. Keep in mind, it's not God that has given us that intuition or that fear, but it's the devil, it's the prince of this world that has given us that fear. That way we become that much more vulnerable. I can, I'm can. i on board with, with some of that. Uh, and you've been studying sharks and their tendencies for many years. How did you get interested in sharks, and how did you turn this into a career? Well, actually, uh, I'm interested in evolution, so I'm a biologist. I'm really primarily fascinated by 
why there's so many different kinds of life forms on the planet and how they came to be. You can imagine another planet with life on it. I'm sure there's many of them, but they might not have as much diversity. They might not have things like giant trees and bugs and bacteria and birds and whales. They might just have sort of a homogeneous bacterial kind of coating. And, but that's not the case here, so I'm really interested in how it is that these organisms become so different from one another and interact with one another and eat one another and have commensal relationships with one another. And sharks are particularly interesting because they are sort of the counterexample where they haven't really evolved as quickly as some of the other organisms. We've got 300,000 species of beetles, uh, but we've only got about 1,200 species of sharks and rays, and they've been around for 400 million years. So their evolution is quite different from other animals, and, and when things are different, that can teach us quite a lot about uh, all of the diversification process. So, so that's my real reason. Uh, sharks are interesting for their own sake, but my particular interest is in their evolution. Well, they are amazing creatures, and they play a role in the ocean's ecosystem, obviously, as an inhabitant. So can you expand on that and also talk about how important sharks are to the health of marine ecosystems? That's a great question. And uh, just for sort of uh, complete transparency, we always assume that if sharks aren't around, that the oceans will completely collapse and go to hell. Um, and that, that's very likely the case but we don't actually know what would happen if we got rid of the sharks certainly it would cause an adjustment some animals that sharks prey upon would be in higher numbers and the organisms that they feed on would be in lower numbers so there'd be a new steady state and it would be very different from what we're used to seeing now but we don't actually know what would happen or what their role is in the ocean we know they have a role but we don't know because of the sort of non-linear nature of ecosystems that what would happen if we got rid of sharks. A lot of people say that they have an important role, which they very likely do, but we haven't really characterized what that role is. What are you most concerned about regarding keeping sharks safe and thriving? Well, I think that humans really like the world that we find ourselves in and we're very frightened of change. And if there is a lot of change and there's a new steady state, we're frightened that we may not like the future. We may not be able to deal with it. It may be hotter than we're used to. It may be more toxic than we're used to. We may not be able to go outside as much as we would like to. And so people don't like things that are different than they're used to. And so, Given that, we probably would like to keep these ocean systems and terrestrial systems the way they are um, because we don't really, we're, we're terrified of what they might be and that we might not like what they become. Yeah, we don't have to look too far to find uh, that uh, to, be, uh, to be the case. Uh, even think about barrier islands. Naturally, they'd be moving, but we like to pave things, build houses and homes, uh, and uh, we want barrier islands to remain just as they were when we first settled them 80 years ago or whatever that may have been in some cases. Uh, with rising ocean temperatures, how does that affect the movement and behavioral patterns of sharks? That's a great question. So sharks have been around for a long time. Uh, they've been through the Permian extinction, the Cretaceous extinction. So sharks, when things get sort of bad, they go somewhere else. So they're quite capable of moving their large animals. But their movement patterns will be affected by the food that they rely on. So as waters warm, certain fishes that uh, were not able to live in certain parts of the world, as waters warm, those tropical fishes will move into those areas and the sharks will follow them. And so, for example, we have um, a sea trout, coral sea trout from the Great Barrier Reef showing up in Tasmania, which is colder water. And as they move down there, these sort of tropical reef fishes move to Tasmania, the sharks will follow them. So we'll find sharks in areas where we're not used to seeing them, but the sharks themselves will probably be okay. 
And going from climate to more immediate short-term weather impacts, uh, when it comes to big storms, for example, hurricanes, typhoons, how do sharks cope with storms like hurricanes? Do they uh, go elsewhere? Do they evacuate like a, a human would? Uh, or uh, do they go deeper down into the water? How do they... Uh, or that, really that, that's a very good question. Uh, there's only one very rigorous study that I know of by a scientist in Australia. She's an American scientist, Michelle Hupel, and she studied a different species of sharks than the ones that we get here in the US. And she found that as barometric pressure fell, these animals will go to deeper water. So when there's a storm around, the sharks will go deep, this particular species. now. Just because one species responds that way doesn't mean they all will. Um, and it's quite possible that storms will churn things up. There'll be different food available. And so some sharks may come into an area after a storm, whereas other species will go to deeper water. So it's really on a case-by-case -case basis. So the one that you're showing right <laughs> now is a reef shark, that's Melanopterus. And, and that shark now that you, you're showing there is a tiger shark. So. These are both tropical animals, and uh, they're often associated with shallow water and reefs, so they would probably go to deeper water. And Gavin, we want to get to our first viewer question now. This comes from uh, Adrienne in uh, Maryland. And so Adrienne writes, uh, how do researchers like yourself uh, determine the age of a shark? That's an excellent question. So in the past, what we've been able to do is we can tag animals when they're little, and then when we recapture them, we can measure how long they are, and we know how long from the tag, how long they've been at large, and we can see a relationship between the length <laughs> and the age. And we can do a regression and see that a shark of a certain length has a certain, is a certain age. But once they get fully grown, that becomes much harder. It's sort of asymptotic graph. So what people have done in the past is they've counted vertebral rings. It turns out that a lot of sharks lay down rings every year, or, or two rings a year. So by counting the rings in the vertebra, you can actually age the animals. But that also is a bit fraught with problems when they get very big. So we're actually developing uh, epigenetic or genomic methods to see if we can estimate the shark age solely from blood samples. And these are new techniques that are being developed by uh, myself and some colleagues at the University of Georgia um, and at the Georgia Aquarium based on blood samples. We don't know how well it's going to work, but it's, we want to do non-lethal sampling that tells us about the age of a shark. But to do that, we have to use aquarium animals of known age to see, you know, this animal really is 55 <laughs> years old. Um, because if we don't know how old an animal is, how will we know that the measure that we're developing how will we calibrate it? So we're currently in the stages of calibrating these samples. Very interesting, Gavin. Well, uh, this is interesting information so far. We're only just beginning. Uh, sharks are not the only predators in the water. So coming up later in our weather-wise segment, we'll have three things to know. We're going to reveal some of the most dangerous creatures in the sea. Uh, but next, find out what triggers a shark attack and uh, if rising ocean temperatures might be to blame. We're going to also answer more of your questions when Ask the Experts continues. All right, let's go back to the front of this. Which I find that uh, this will be a very interesting subject. That uh, even even myself uh, found to be extremely different, especially coming out of the Weather Channel. You know, certainly we have you know. One of the things that most people don't realize is that during a lot of the time dinosaurs were on Earth, there was actually a seaway that extended from the Gulf of Mexico all the way up to the Arctic Ocean, and it divided North America in two pieces. <coughs> and that seaway uh, was relatively warm, and tornadoes, hurricanes could have easily come up that that seaway and 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 caused a lot of of damage and, and death to dinosaurs um, all the way from from Texas basically all the way into northern Alberta 
Very interesting. Uh, when we look at uh, recent human history, it seems that when we have periods of extreme cold, uh, there's a little bit more human suffering and uh, dark ages and famine, shorter growing season, things like that. Uh, you mentioned the climate may have been warmer back then. So did dinosaurs thrive in warmer climates? Well, we, you know, we're pretty sure that di most of the dinosaurs, if not all of them, were warm-blooded. So, And we do find dinosaurs on the north slope of Alaska and, you know, high latitudes, um, both in the <laughs> south and in the north. There were dinosaurs in Antarctica. Um, Antarctica, Antarctica. Was, was relatively tropical at the time. Antarctica was tropical at the time. So, um, but they still would have experienced, you know, long nights, um, you know, winter. The, the earth, you know, has, has been tilted at pretty close to the same angle all this time. And so they would have experienced, uh, you know, darkness for some period of time as well. So it had to have been chillier then, but it definitely wasn't you know, it's extreme cold as we have now. So we talk about fossils now. How are fossils formed and how do you know where to look for them? Before we started this uh, the show, we talked a little bit about, it seems that there's a lot of dinosaur uh, bone digging in the western U.S. more so than in Vermont, but I'm an outsider uh, for this kind of thing. So uh, what goes on with the formation of fossils and, and the finding of fossils? Well, first off, um, fossils are based, you know, I like I, you know, basically they're uh, the preserved remains of, of extinct organisms, um, and and to preserve them, basically the the specimens have to be covered up with sediment, and then that uh, wherever whatever they're covered in has to be covered, you know, over time from the time the animal dies until the time that you know that we find them. And so, in the case of dinosaurs, which, you know, dinosaurs lived from about 230 million years ago until about 66 million years ago. And so, they basically have to stay encased in rock in all that time, and then uh, at least be close enough to the surface of the ground now uh, to be found. So, it's all about geology. Uh, it's sediments, uh, weathered rock that covers them, uh, rivers carrying sediment cover um, a dinosaur, for example, or even a, a tree, uh, any, any, any life form. And, and it stays preserved underground in these rock units for millions of years. And that's uh, when fossilization occurs. But then, uh, so we need deposition to cover them up and then we need we need um, basically weathering uh, wind and rain and things like that to uncover them so you know we 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 then basically what we paleontologists do is we go to places where the right age rock that that represents these ancient river systems covered up the dinosaurs but are now exposed at the surface of the ground and it just so happens that you know dinosaurs lived everywhere they lived in vermont and they lived in montana but fortunately montana wyoming colorado utah most of the, these <coughs> western states are places where the right age rock is now exposed at the surface of the ground so we can so we can go out and find them well uh in, in popular conversation it seems generally accepted widely accepted that an asteroid strike may have led to the extinction of dinosaurs but in reality was that the change uh, that led to their demise or could it have been a climate change that ultimately killed the dinosaurs well, there's there's very good evidence that there was a meteor, and and um, yeah, I you know obviously you know a two mile wide meteor striking the Earth is going to cause some climate changes, <laughs> um, but the impact alone, I mean, you just think about the size of the tsunami and and the earthquakes associated with it. I mean, there was. 
a tremendous amount of, of, of you know, disaster surrounding just the impact. But then it also blasted a lot of, of debris into space that would have cut blocked the sun uh, and definitely changed, you know, changed the environment for some period of time. So there's there's you know hypotheses that the that the impact um, created a, a, a like a nuclear winter scenario uh, that cooled the planet pretty drastically, and that could have certainly caused a, a lot of the extinction. But we don't really know. Um, there's some indication that that uh, it may have initiated some some large volcanism uh, it, it, there's just so many things that could have come into play uh, in this particular scenario that you know we're not really positive exactly how it all happened but very good evidence that it was uh, initially caused by an impact and 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 that the impact itself caused a lot of depth of certainly dinosaurs in North America Jack, we have a viewer question, and this one comes from Al in Kentucky. So Al writes, could dinosaurs survive in today's atmosphere? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, they're, they, the, the atmosphere hasn't changed very much uh, in the last 66 million years. So, yeah, I think they'd have been fine. Um, there might have been a little more oxygen then, not not appreciably more. Um, yeah, I think they'd, have been, they'd be just fine. We... we uh, we, we, we humans would be in trouble if they were still around. A lot of interesting information so far. We appreciate your insight. We're going to continue this conversation in just a few minutes when Ask the Experts returns. Coming up later in our... I know that scientists and these different types of people, they have their own opinions about that particular era whenever everything was... In a completely different time zone of what we're in today, but um, I I understand that they talk a little bit about violence pertaining to dinosaurs and, and brontosaurs and every other kind of saurs. I personally think that it was extremely, extraordinarily, violently violent on this planet, and it was a constant war. A struggle between one animal versus another in survival, and um, I, I think that whenever God allowed for them to die out, He allowed for them to die out for a reason. And I think that whenever God recreated uh, the earth, that He took everything that was living then and shrunk it what it is today, such as bats, cats, um, birds, you name it. Um, but looking at looking at, at the trajectory of things, of what went on back then, it was extremely violent, no matter what continent that you was on. And whenever they get to talking about different, um, different land masses pertaining to the continents, I do think that our whole structure of what we're adjusted to do today was totally different than what it was then. I agree, because whenever you find fossils up on top of, let's say, Aspen, Colorado at 20,000 feet, whenever you find sea fossils, water fossils that high, something had to have occurred during that time to have allowed for that sea fossil to have ever gotten that far up north or that far up high. Um, I think that some of that was probably caused from the Great Flood, because there was a Great Flood. But also it could have been a readjustment of the planet Earth of whenever, of whenever uh, the continents was different than what they are today. Um, we're actually dealing with even a guessing game. Um, we've become more, more, um, 
more acceptable when it comes to finding scientific uh, bones and fossils and etc. And I personally think that as the ice melts, we're going to find out a whole lot more about the North Pole and the South Pole. And some of that stuff that we're going to find out about, we may really not be comfortable in finding out about what was there or what even has the potential of still being there. I don't know. But, um, I mean, it talks about in the Bible how the how this big planet basically uh, ceased uh, turning and churning, pertaining to the wind stopping. It also talks about the planet opening up the great locusts that are basically torment mankind because of all the wickedness and the sin that humanity has brought, brought up onto itself. And we're basically seeing the uh, extinction of this great planet called Earth that now we're living a part of and seeing the end of it. The, the dinosaurs seen the beginning of it and in the process of the beginning of that I think that there was spiritual warfare or battles during that time and I think that um, I think that whenever God resolved that and ended that he recreated mankind through the dust of the earth and that's whenever Satan basically intervened and that's whenever there was war in heaven and that's whenever Satan has tried to taint, destroy, manipulate God's grand design pertaining to human, the human race here. And of course we see where uh, this wicked one, Lucifer, has really given the Creator um, a lot of controversy and a lot of uh, a lot of problems because God basically had to take the original blueprint and rip it up after he found that he was distraught that he even made earth and whenever he flooded earth um, that was the new blueprint in that new blueprint come along with with uh, after Noah come along with Moses after Moses in that blueprint come along with Jesus after Jesus is putting us in the blueprint of where we are now towards our planet changing every day because of the damages that we are doing to the planet and this is all lining up with things that has already done been pre-selected forecasted out of the Bible that's going to occur that already has occurred that will occur futuristically speaking with world-renowned paleontologist Jack Horner Jack thanks again for making time for us today and Jack Mo, you were recently in Montana for a dig. Temps over 100 degrees. Montana can get hot in the summer. So how much does weather impact you when you're out in the field? Well, it, you know, as I get older, um, it, it, I, it gets worse and worse. You know, I... Uh, the old gray Mary ain't what she used to be, right? Let's move on here. Right here. This from uh, Yale University back in the 1960s was, was really the the person who 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 got us really thinking about